This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Elvis Presley, each traced with thousands of intricately shaped stained glass ellipses. Elvis stood tall, a colossus in antique purple and red glass. Joni, a golden angel, rendered in sunny yellow and clear. In the same room was a pipe organ that stretched floor to ceiling, much bigger than the one Captain Nemo played in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Much bigger. In addition to my two grand pianos, there was a two-manual German harpsichord. My whole house was wired as a recording studio. The glowing room was a glimpse of rock and roll heaven. Would I ever get there? Perhaps not. And perhaps that's the reason I went for the fast cars instead of fast money. I was 23 years old. Life beyond the age of 30 was unimaginable. By writing songs for Glenn Campbell, Mr. Sinatra, Liza Minnelli, and others, I had opened myself up to a left cross from snobby journalists and other elitists. Some said I was middle of the road, represented the establishment, and all that left-wing folky exclusivity that doesn't buy a stick of gum in the world of music today. The truth is, I was a heavy pot smoker, a sexual adventurer, and a hopelessly liberal Democrat who hated the war in Vietnam. I had some redeeming qualities. Aside from the occasional beer, I didn't drink or smoke tobacco. I was lauded as the Cole Porter of the 60s, or even worse, as pop music's Mozart, in a critical press more than slightly intimidated by the proliferation of loud rock bands. Journalists and mature people all over the country who were encouraged by the fact that I was a young man who saw things their way, I wrote them the way they used to write them. Meanwhile, just like every other kid, my favorite bands were the Beatles and the Stones. That summer, I threw my suitcase into the trunk of my brand new, sleek, shark-like silver Corvette 427 and drove out through San Bernardino and the Inland Empire to Route 390 going north. I opened her up at close to 100 miles an hour heading for Las Vegas, where I was appearing with the hardest working little girl in show business, Connie Stevens. After a sudden divorce from crooner Eddie Fisher, she was remounting her career with a show at Wilbur Clark's Desert Inn, which had just recently been purchased by Howard Hughes. He bought the hotel and casino after arguing with a manager over extending his reservation. He now occupied the blacked-out top two of the tower's nine floors. On the drive, I was steaming over an item I had read in the New Musical Express on my last trip to London. Jim Webb is back in town with his orchestra or whatever, the paper sneered. Who was I, Percy Faith? And who was Jim Webb, anyway? The same London publication groused that whoever had changed my name to Jimmy was an asshole. My name is Jimmy Webb on my birth certificate. Upon moving to Hollywood and being informed that Jimmy was not an especially cool name and would have to be changed, I had fired that particular manager. Perhaps someone who was more concerned about dropping their left for a bunch of Donny Osmond and John Denver haters might have thought twice about baiting the bear with an appearance at a casino, but I met Connie and she charmed me without any particular effort. I knew her mostly from 1963's Palm Springs Weekend, in which she played the good girl. It was no act. With my guitarist Fred Tackett, a true hippie, I worked up a few songs for Connie and me to perform. I idled through the gate of the Desert Inn, one of Vegas's original five casinos. In five-foot-tall letters, the marquee said, Connie Stevens. Underneath it said, Jimmy Webb. Connie had insisted on me having equal billing. 
There was a message from Connie at the front desk to meet her in the crystal room to rehearse our duet of a song called Didn't We. The crystal room was a modest venue. Our capacity was 450 for dinner.